you have to make the personal decision of what you're going to do because we don't step out as a body of believers. We step out as individuals who are coming into the obedience of Christ. And he's going to show every one of us things that we can do. And so I'm not going to go with the we. I'm going with the I. What am I going to do? Am I going to move? Am I going to be one of his workers? And, and that's really what I want to... Uh, bring to the front as we transition this morning. Am I going to be one, one of the invited ones? And I want to pray to that end. Heavenly Father, this morning you orchestrate things so well by your Spirit. We could say that Mina just chose these songs. We could just say that these things are spoken. We could, we could just say that this just happens. But the truth is, God, we either believe that you have plans or, or we don't. And God, we can miss it and we can make things up and we can, we can be on our own sometimes, but God, you really do want to use us to bring forth your plans in every heart and in every life. And so God, this morning I'm asking, would you make that even more real to us this morning? What we sing, oh God, let it be something that is on the inside of us and, and it moves us, and honestly moves us. God, I thank you that we can come together. We came here for purpose, Father. Nobody walked into this place totally by accident and didn't know it was a church. We came in because there's a meeting. And God, while we are gathered, what we want is a meeting. We want to meet with you by spirit and have you speak to us and challenge us and teach us but we just really want to be with you. Because when we're with you, we know more about who we are. And I pray, oh Father, make that so real by the working of your spirit in this house today, oh God. Challenge our hearts to believe that you see us. Right where we are, who we are, and why you have brought us to this place. And I thank you, God, because that's, I know that's your desire. I read your word. I know that. Thank you that you're going to do even more of that. And we bless you for what you're doing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I don't know what, what your response is, and this was just wonderful, Mina. Thank you, Justin, and the team. Um, because honestly, the, the, the message that I have this morning is more of this. An invitation. Just by a, a raised hand, how many this last week were gathered together with more than just the usual in your house or home um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sometime. How, how many of you had people gathered together somewhat, somewhere, okay? How many of you, was it mostly family? Can I see that? Uh, a lot of you. How many of you really get along well with your family? Can I, can I see your hands? <laughs> I'm meddling now. I, because what I know is in every family, you learn how to take each other. You don't see eye to eye with people, and you know you don't. For the most part, you can get along because you know who they are. I've got family, and I love family. We had, I think, 40, 41, 42 people at our house on Thursday. You see generations, great grandma, us, our kids, grandkids, which are great grandkids. You just look at this and you're going, God, I, that, that's wild. But can I ask, in, in, in your gatherings, what's the central act? What's the central, when you, I'm going to say this about Thanksgiving, not some of the other holidays, but what, what would you say is the, is the main emphasis then when you, and don't say Thanksgiving, okay? 
I'm talking about what you do together. What, what are you, what, what's, the, what's the culmination, so to speak? What's the big deal? I'll go with... <laughs> you sit at a table. And you fellowship. But there's something about gathering people and coming to the table that really is very special. And typically, you know, you, you've got... You've got special things that you only do at holidays that are laid out on tables, and you, you have the special people or the people you've invited. I was talking to some who invited different ones over because they don't have as much family around. And I'm, I just love that. Some of us who have extended family quite large, we're, we're kind of spoiled compared to, to some. But I love that whole thing of coming to the table. Because this whole service, th this is what I'm after. We, I, we announced a couple weeks ago that we were going to have communion. But I want to put a little bit of a different spin on it today. But what I want to title it is Invited to the Table. Because there's, there's so many things. I mean, I, I listen to every song we sang this morning. It just, it just blows me away sometimes. But I, I, um, I, I have a couple passages that I want to have you turn to with me. And then we're going to just do some talking. Matthew chapter 16, a very familiar passage to you, but I do want you to understand that it's Matthew chapter 16. So that tells you it's not Matthew 5, and it's not Matthew 10, it's not Matthew 14, it's Matthew 16. So it's down the road a little bit, okay? Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, most of you will know this very well. And Jesus, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Asking his disciples that question. And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And, and sometimes, church, when, when we read these passages, this is why I like the chosen so much. Many times we don't read the scripture as if it would be dialogue. We read it as if it just went through and they didn't even take a breath in between and they didn't look at each other and they didn't do some of these things. And yet I believe that there's this interaction and, and that he's going... You know, whom, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And one goes, well, I know I, what I heard. I, I heard somebody say you look like Elijah, like they know what Elijah looked like. Some say John the Baptist, come back. Right? Yeah. Others, you're just one of those prophets. Say you, 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 they, they're familiar by Scripture or by history to one of the other prophets. And so that's who they're saying. And, so, and then he, he looks at them again. He says, but who do you say that I am? And I really, I mean, every time you read, you can get something different out of it. And it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Which, by the way, that means Simon, son of Jonas. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say to thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I know that most of you who have read that before, you're going, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I get it. I, I think that's awesome. But I love the separation. Who do they say I am? Because they don't get it. 
but I've been walking with you guys. Who, who, who do you say I am? See, the easy question to answer was, who do they say I am? But when it came right down to it, and he says, but I really want to know, who do you say I am? And then Peter answers, and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And immediately Jesus brought it into the next dimension and said, yes. And Peter, flesh and blood has not, you didn't get that naturally. Spirit brought that to you. Our Father in heaven brought that to you. That tells you about a connection you have with something that the rest of these don't see and don't understand. As you gathered in your various Thanksgiving gatherings, some of you know that you're much closer to some than you are others. You're either natured the same or you have common interest in one way or another. And some others, you just learn how to take them as you get older especially and you just go, yeah, yeah, that's them. <laughs> Am I the only one? Do we need to call for an altar call now? Oh, okay. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Just a quick read here of three verses. Mark chapter 6 says this. And he went out from there. Now, where did he come out of? If you're looking in Mark chapter 5, he had just raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead in a different city. And from there, it says, and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many of them hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these things? How does he know this stuff? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? So there's a group of people talking. Then they say, is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. You see, th what, I'm, what I'm getting at today and what we're going to talk about, I'm going I'm to tell you who's at the table, at the first table. I think you'll find it interesting. I studied and studied after I started on this because I knew that there was more in it and I wanted to get there. And I feel like I have. And I just want to bring it to you this morning. For some of you, who are here this morning, some of you probably couldn't even go home for Thanksgiving. You're not invited anymore. Or some of you who might be the only ones who have real faith in your family, you, you feel like you're ostracized and off to the side, and, and you get this passage because they look at you and go, who do you think you are? We watched you grow up. We know who you are. You just always thought you were all that. And look at you now, still on the same train. And you're going, I, I don't have any idea why you say that. Turn to another passage with me, if you would. And then you can rest your hands for just a little bit. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 starting in verse 2, and it says this, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, which was whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And there's 12 names there, 
but it's written in historical fashion because when, when you're looking at where they would have been, it wouldn't have said certain things about them. This is all from them looking back at their experience and writing down the history and putting it in place, and I'm going to show you some of that. Because, yeah, while they knew that G Judas betrayed him, none of them at the table knew that Judas was the betrayer until it was revealed, right? So this is, this is armchair quarterback writing about who that was and who some of these are. But I find it interesting. We sang that we ran out of the grave, Right? Why did we run out of the grave in the song? Nice and loud. You said it. Go ahead. You called my name. You called my name, and I ran out of the grave. I came out of death. I want to share some interesting things with you this morning because I, I just, I did think we have to imagine some things, okay? But I'm not going into crazy imagination. I'm just putting things together that would be quite logical in my opinion and, and where I see it, I mean, since Chosen has done what it's done, you, you, can, you can get a coloring of in the black lines, so to speak. And yet most of everything they do is just hidden. It, it's in here. It's hidden a little bit, but it's in here, and we just don't appreciate it the same way because it's, we read it like... <laughs> so who's probably the most known disciple? Probably Peter, right? And it's just interesting. Peter has such a, a, an awesome story. And it's spelled out in Scripture in, in kind of a funny way. But also have to know that Peter had a brother who was also a disciple, right? His name was? Andrew. In fact, there are three sets of brothers in the twelve. James and John, and Philip, and Nathaniel, which is also called Bartholomew. They, it says surnamed, okay? What's a surname? Last name, right? It's your family name. That's what they would call it. These guys seem to have a different way of surname. They, like Peter was Simon, Barjona. Peter, I mean, uh, Simon, son of Jonas, okay? That's, so his family, they knew his dad. But it's interesting to me that a little known fact right out of Scripture is that Jesus is actually the one that named Peter. In fact, he's the one that when he called him in John chapter 1, John records this. John is the one who gives more intimate details of things. You know what Jesus first called Peter? I mean, Simon. Cephas, called him that six times, Cephas, and I will call you Cephas. John chapter 1 verse 42 says he was Cephas, and Cephas means a stone. It wouldn't mean a rock, it means a stone. It would mean a, a stone that you would hold in your hand, and he called Peter Cephas. He said, I call you Cephas. Peter and his brother Andrew, what were they doing when they got the actual call from Jesus? 
Nice and loud. Come on, you guys know the Bible. There you go. That's, that's the kind of answer I'd like. I mean, you know what, just say it. You don't have to worry about somebody else, and if it's wrong, we'll, we'll let it fuck bow and get, get the right one from somebody. It's okay. They were fishing. But Andrew is an interesting one. Because you know the story of Andrew is actually, you know, because he's got a sibling named Peter. And can you imagine being the brother of Peter and trying to follow Jesus? How many times do you think Andrew said, just shut up? And Peter goes, I'll shut you up. Isn't that what happens at Thanksgiving dinners? <laughs> You know, that's what I'm saying. How, these guys are siblings, and, and they're going to they're gonna get along, and they're going to follow Jesus together for three years. But here's another kicker. Who is the first one called? See, John chapter 1, if you read through John chapter 1, you have such interesting details because what you're going to find out, and I'm going to reveal some of these things to you because there's just a little bit of question, but not much. But see, when John the Baptist was preaching, you guys know who John the Baptist was, right? Okay, thank you. When John the Baptist was preaching, the day before Jesus' baptism, John had two disciples that were standing with him. Later on, we find out the name of one. His name is Andrew. And Andrew is there the next day when Jesus comes. And John declares him to be the one whose shoes he's not able even right, could, could be right to loose his shoes. And it says that Andrew and the other disciples, the disciple followed Jesus. And they said, was walking behind him, and it says that Jesus turned around and says, what do you want with me? And they said, we'd like to go home with you. Where do you live? And they followed him. That's Andrew. Andrew's the one that went and told his brother Peter, according to John chapter 1. And obviously, Peter wasn't all that amused in the beginning, until Jesus came to them while they were in the boat. But he was forewarned by Brother Andrew. Where were James and John when they were called? In the boat. Except they were just mending nets with who? Dad. That sounds like a glorious day. What do you do for a living? Stinking fishing. I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, okay. You wish you could do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean, net fishing, and they've got to mend the nets, and they've got to fix them up so that they work, and they do all this stuff. And, and I'm sure they're just going through the motions. This is what it is. And here comes Jesus to the boat and says, follow me. Now, I, I've done a, a serious study about this, and I can't find one place where John is mentioned before James. So what does that give me the assumption of? I'm assuming James is older. And James has place, but this is not the James that wrote the book of James. This is James, the son of Zebedee, not the son of Joseph. And so when you look at this and then you realize that there's another James and another Simon. And who's this Lebius that's also called Thaddeus? Let me walk with you a little bit. So Andrew is one who 
evidently is inquisitive about things and, and he has another sidekick with him and they saw John the Baptist and, and, and Jesus, when they turned to him, when he turned to them and said, we just want to go home, where, where, where do you live? And he just gave three little words. You know what they are? Come and see. Come and see. Andrew was also the one in uh, John chapter 6 that brought the five loaves and two fishes to Jesus and says, look, I don't know what's, what it's worth, but I've got a little lad over here. He's got five loaves, two fishes, and Jesus said, bring it to me. You know what happened out of that. He fed thousands. I don't know about this Andrew guy. It seems like he was, he was actually the real deal. And I have a feeling that he helped navigate with Peter and with James and John. Except, I don't know how this worked. Because Jesus separated Peter and James and John in John chapter 1 and called them a special name. What was that? Come on, you know. Somebody does. Sons of thunder. Awesome. Sons of thunder. What does that mean? It might mean they're the loudest ones at the table. Or it might be that they're the ones who will just take the lead and, and, and do what he says. I don't know. But Jesus called them the sons of thunder. It's a Hebrew name. starts with a B. Boarginis. Something like that. But it means the sons of thunder. Peter, James, and John. And you're going to find that Peter, James, and John did several things together. And Andrew's not there. And yet Andrew was the spokesman and the first really disciple that was going to be the one there. And then what we find out is then these other brothers, Philip and Bartholomew or Nathaniel, whichever one you want to say, um, them, are, them are the same. I believe Philip is the second disciple that was with him with Andrew because Philip and Andrew show up in different places constantly in which tells me that they were probably friends and they lived in the same city the same village and that they they had a commonness because if they were the two that went together to see John the Baptist later on they have a couple more activities of things that it was Philip and Andrew so Andrew didn't need Peter to be his you know guy that he had rapport with he had Philip and Philip seemed to go with this group and those two were buds. They loved being together. I love the story of Philip because Philip is then going to go and talk to his brother Nathaniel. And it's interesting to me because the reason I, th one of the reasons why I think Philip would have been the other guy is because. Both Peter, I mean, both um, Andrew and Philip, both of them went to their brother to try to bring them to Jesus because they were absolutely convinced from the beginning this is the, this is the Messiah. And so when you see that, and then so Philip then goes to Nathaniel and says, come, and, come, 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 come and see. What he said was, we have found the Messiah, the one that's been spoken of. And Nathaniel said, it's Jesus, and, and Philip said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And what did Nathaniel say? Good, good luck, brother. You can tell. Hey, he doesn't, he goes, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because that seemed to be a saying back then. Nazareth was not the, the best cream of the crop town, village. And so, he, you know, Nathaniel's there and he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip rehearses three words that Jesus had just told him in the last couple days. Come and see. And Nathaniel does. He, he goes with Philip and he gets to Jesus and Jesus said, hey, here is a disciple with, with, there's no guile in him. In other words, 
He doesn't play games. He puts it right out there. It's not pretentious whatsoever. He throws it right out there. And Nathaniel says, what do you know about me? And Jesus said, before your brother Philip told you, I saw you sitting under the tree. Immediately, Nathaniel says, you are the Messiah. You did come from God. And he, Jesus spoke back and said, yeah. Is it because I told you what you didn't know that I knew? Is that what convinced you? And he goes on into a, a little bit more saying about things. But see, what I love about these things is when you look at the personalities of these guys, you got three guys with siblings that are going to follow Jesus. And so you know what has to happen. We're going to have to lay aside some things so that we can get along because we are not the object of this, even though some of them think they are, especially a certain one named Simon. But you, you have to realize that these guys have all been called by one person. And that's what brings them together. Without going further in, in these guys, I, I want you to understand then one of the reasons why I found that Matthew 16 was so important. If this isn't the first time that Jesus called him that, but Jesus was the one who gave him the name Cephas. And then Jesus is the one who gave him the name Peter. His name was not Peter until it says that Jesus clearly says it in Scripture. I believe it's in Mark 3.16 that Jesus said, I call you Peter, which is rock. In Jesus' eyes, Peter, Simon, graduated from Cephas to Petros, which is from a stone to a rock. And that's when he said, you've got the revelation. Now upon this rock, upon this rock, Petros, we, this, this is what we're going to build the kingdom on, upon the understanding that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the Most High God. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it. Let me quickly go through some other guys here. Thomas. Thomas had another name too. It, it's not hugely important, but hey, it's, it is. Thomas's other name was Didymus. D-I-D-Y-M-A-S or M-U-S. And it's interesting to me because what that means is twain or double. So what I'm thinking, Thomas was a twin. And if that's the case, then he knows what it's like to have people around him who are really close and have to wear the same clothes until they're 12 and... I don't know if they did or not, but you know how they dress up twins most of the time. And, and you, you look at this kind of thing, and the stuff is in there, and that's what it says. Why else would you call him, uh, you know, that name? And he's called that on a couple of occasions. He's known as Didymus. But Thomas is another interesting fellow because, you know, what he's known as is Doubting Thomas. But Thomas has much more to say than some of the other disciples who were never, never mentioned as having said a word. And on a couple of occasions, Thomas is the forceful one, the stronger one. When Jesus said he's going back to Jerusalem, Thomas is the one that sped, said, well, then let us go with him and die. Let's die with him. So I think doubting Thomas is really an unfair um, statement about Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus, is called James the Less. And um, even in Scripture, he's called James the Less. And you don't know a lot about James the Less. Um, you'd have to really probably go in historical record to find very much about him, except that he's the son of Alphaeus. That's, that's all it says. And Matthew is also has another name. And he started a, a jeans company. 
I'm just teasing. <laughs> Levi's. That was his other name, Levi. I was just trying to help you a little, okay? That way you could make an accurate guess. But his name was Levi, and he was considered um, a pretty bad guy, not because he was a bad guy, but because of what? His job. They called him a publican, a tax collector, and so he was the one that worked between the Romans and the Jews to extract from them the necessary dues that the Romans wanted. And so in a sense, he had sold himself to the Romans and wasn't well liked for that. This guy, Levius, surnamed Thaddeus, in another passage, his name is Judas. And so he would be the second Judas. It's in Luke chapter 6, 16, and Acts chapter 1 that he's mentioned, but also in one place, he's, he says the, the Judas, the brother of James, which we don't know if that was that James, and there could be other brothers involved here. Don't know. Then there was Simon the Canaanite. He's called the Canaanite in that Acts chapter, I mean in that Matthew chapter. Simon the Canaanite was also called something else in another passage, and he is called Simon Zelotes. And that makes him of a group of people who weren't going to sit back and let the Romans just take over and think that they're not going to stand up against them in some fashion. And that's why he's also called Simon the Zealot, the Zelotes. But it was a group of people, a certain region area where those people, they congregated together in this idea that we're not just going to be, I mean, you know, it's, it's probably the Michigan militia type attitude. Some of you know who were there in January. And I better not go there. And then you've got Judas Iscariot, and Judas Iscariot, uh, we do know that his father's name was Simon. Simon was a popular name, evidently. And Iscariot simply means that he was from a town or a region called Cariot, and so Simon, a Judas from Cariot, Judas Iscariot, and we know that he was the one that betrayed Jesus, but we also know that he was the treasurer of the group. He held the bag, the money. We also know that there was issues in his life later on, but which one of us don't have issues in our lives at times? And you might say, why am I going through this? And I will tell you why. Because this morning, we have said that we're going to have communion. And what we typically do is that we rightfully make Jesus the central figure at the table who ministers to those gathered, and he's the one that gathered them. But this morning, what I felt to do was talk to you about the invitation to the table. Because, see, if I'm looking at these guys, and I'm looking at myself... Many times we know our, our stuff. We know our not-so-good stuff. We know all that, and we're going... Um, I don't know if we should do this or not. I don't know that I'm able to take communion. I don't know what all is involved here. But what I wanted to give you an understanding of this morning is these 12, including Judas, had no idea that they were coming to the first communion. He didn't pre-warn them. They were going to do the feast of the Passover. That's what they were gathered for. And when the supper had ended, that's when he takes up the towel, and then they have the cup and the bread, and you're going, well, if you'd have told us, we would have killed a dove, because that's what you did at that time, or done something so that I could get ready, so that I could make sure I was in a good place, so that I could do this. And I'm going, the invitation to the table, and I'm please understand me, I know what Scripture says about communion, but I also know how the enemy works in our lives. Oh, 
we will disqualify ourselves because we had a bad day. Do you think these guys who walked with Jesus for three years might have had displays of different things in front of Jesus himself? Do you think that Peter was the only one who disagreed with Jesus on a few occasions? When Jesus, even, even at the very end here, when, when Jesus is going to wash feet, and what's Peter do? All the rest of them can go along with the story, but not Simon. Simon's got to stand up and say, you are not going to wash my feet. Can you imagine, Andrew? Here we go again. Would you just sit down and shut up? Always got to be the one. John, who himself, by his own writing, calls himself the beloved disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Now, there's an easy guy to get along with. You got 12 guys sitting at the table, but I'm the one he loves. <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> they were probably going to write a Dear John letter. That's what they were probably going to do and say, I don't know how we're going to live without you, but we're going to try. <laughs> That these are things that are, that are all in the fiber of these guys. And they, they're just coming to do what they have done on a couple of occasions before. They're going to celebrate the feast together. They were Jewish, and so they're going to come into Jerusalem, and they're going to celebrate together. They know the story. They've been doing it all their life. They know how to do it, and they're not surprised. But this one's different. I look at these guys and I'm going, wonder what I would have done. We look at each other. Can you imagine looking around the table and going, Thanksgiving, huh? I wouldn't play cards with you or you because I think you cheat. You always hog the most food, so I'm hoping we'll pass it the other way. You, I mean, come on. These guys have walked together for three years, and they're invited to a table. And they're just going to be who they are because that's who they've come to be. They're just at the table with the Messiah, and they know it's him. But they've learned some things. Jesus wanted to share his life with them just as he does with us. I wonder how many times sibling rivalry got in the way. I wonder how many times there were hard misunderstandings as they followed Jesus so some of them would follow about, you know, 25, 30 feet behind in groups. That's when small groups started. And because they weren't getting along and, and so some of those would just be over here, and they're going, can you believe he said that? Yeah, I can. Can you believe what, what Peter said? Well, he's just an idiot. He'll say anything. Yeah, but John kind of backed him up. I know, and then those three guys get special attention. He's always calling them. Do you not think that happened? I firmly believe it would happen. If I followed somebody for three years, but I didn't have, th this is not get along Charlie here. I follow Jesus, but we have to somehow get along. And, and I don't know, and we're all going to come from different places in different ways. And that's another reason why I love the chosen. I, lo I love the way they put Matthew in there. He's the geek squad. But they're all invited to the table. And Jesus said, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. Why? Because Jesus knew why he had come. What did he say when the disciples said, 
Jesus, your, your mother and your brethren are outside and they would see you. He said, yeah, I'll be right out. No, he didn't. He said, who are my mother and my brethren but those who do the will of the Father? So he came on a mission to introduce us to a kingdom that is unseen but has a pull and a gravity and a family involved in it. And see, what I, what I see in this is sometimes I think we get so messed up. People talking like, oh, we don't really need the church. We don't really, we are the church. I don't think any of the disciples would have stayed home and still been disciples. They can believe all they want to. Why? Because God has a desire to have a gathering of his family together so that they can grow in one another. They can learn how to get along with each other. They found out the strengths and the weaknesses of each other because about the time we, we might get tired of you, but there's something that you bring to the table that we can't do without. And so we want you at our table. We want you at the place where, we, where, where you're willing to be used and you can bring you, the stuff that you're good at into the table and it becomes this beautiful work that only God could do because many of us now come on just say it some of us would not exactly get along except for him but what we have found out is the things we don't get along on uh, they, they, they're diminished because of who he is I don't have to see you through my eyes. I can see you easily through his eyes. And if he's invited you to the table, then all of us should be honored to sit at the table and say, God, we just want to sit at the table with you. I don't know why I'm here. I don't feel like I'm one of the sons of thunder. And sometimes I'm glad about that. But I would have loved to seen the transfiguration. Does this make sense to you? You see, this is where church is getting messed up. Each of us have a belonging, but the truth is, nobody's out there with a whip. Nobody's out there telling, don't you go to that church, or you better go to that church, or something like that. No, you make individual choices every time you're going to go somewhere. But the point is, there needs to be a place where that family has a connection, and there's a place where he is calling us to the table. And when we get to the table, it's no longer about who we are. It's he is teaching us and leading us and giving us the opportunity to sit at his table. So I don't care if we're Simon and Jesus calls us, or if we're James and you don't hear a word out of us, son of Alphaeus. Here's what I was challenged with this morning, or through the week for this morning. What do you want Jesus to call you? What would he know you for? What would be his inside name for you? Does it mean you're awesome? Does it mean you're perfect? Does it mean that you're just really in? No, no, no. In my opinion, what it means is he knows you and you know him. And when he calls you, by a name that's different than the name you're known by. It's intimate. We're together. This is family. I love to be together. I just, I am so, studying through this week and having Thanksgiving gathering this week and all this, I'm just going, man, can we, can we ever overestimate the value of the invitation to the table? That he would have the same desire for every one of us to sit at the table as he did for those 12. Just as much. He is inviting us to say, what we have, most don't understand. Most aren't going to get it. And I see where you're at, and I know where I called you from. And I know it hasn't been easy. 
I mean, some of you left father and mother in the boat. Others of you left occupation. Some of you have to put up with people. But you still responded to the invitation. And he's saying, come and sit at my table. And I want to share with you the best part of who I am. And that's, that's what I see here today. What do you want to be known by him? If the ones who are going to attend would just come up to the table, we're going to get ready to do our communion. See, I, I, I look at this and Jesus said, as often as you do this, don't do it in remembrance of us. Don't do it because you think you're special. Don't do it because you could call yourself one of the 12. Do it in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Why? Because my time has come and I'm going to be offered as a sacrifice and I'm going to die for the sins of the world and you don't even understand yet. But when you are on the other side of this thing, there's going to be something so miraculous in your life and you're going to be seen in a complete different life and don't forget your name. Do you notice when Jesus talked to Peter after he rose from the dead? He still called him Peter. He didn't say, Simon, do you love me? <laughs> Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, I'm calling you back and in. I know you denied me. I told you you would. That's not the point. You have keys to the kingdom that I promised you that we're going to need in this time. And isn't it interesting on the day of Pentecost, who was the first one that stood up and said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Sing, it's only the ninth hour. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You see how God wants to use us. And some of us, we almost can get the feel that we ought to just go do something. Jesus very, very clearly said, I only do what the Father shows me or tells me. That's what he does. But evidently, one of the most important things, in my opinion, it is the most important thing, and that is hearing. I say hearing in the Spirit is seeing in the mystery. And he's got things that we're supposed to do, but he wants to tell us what to do, and we go do it. I don't go around praying for all the dead people. But I hear him say, would you go and do that one? I don't know if this is too much for you or not, but I will tell you this. We've done funerals at this church, and on a couple or more occasions being the last one here to close up the building because it's not weird to me I open up that casket and say is it this one is it time to get up yet what would happen if there would be someone who people had visibly seen in a casket, and suddenly they're raised from the dead. Do you think that news would travel? Would it possibly take over Facebook? Do you think it might get a few likes? I will tell you right now, you start raising the dead, people will travel for thousands of miles to be in a meeting. What Ryan said is, what is missing in the church a lot is the power of God. But I will tell you what gives you the power of God. It's a seat at the table. And if we're not willing to come into him... And say, I lay aside who I am. I just love when you call my name. I just want to hear you say it again. Call me by name and let me sit at your table. 
That's what I want you to meditate on as we're taking this morning. You have a right to the table. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you have a right to the table. He's invited you. I don't care what your last weekend was like. I don't care if you, under your breath, cursed family member. God knows your heart. You want to follow him. You desire to be with him. You want to grow in him. See you at the table. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do what we typically do, and that is we're going to start on the outside. And you'll go and you'll come on this side first, on the bread side, and you'll start over here, and you'll come on the bread side and go that way. Come out of your seats this way. Come down this aisle. Go through there, and then go back around to your seats. Then when that is done, then you guys will go right from here, go down there. And if you want to, you can go, oh, you better not. You better come around the table. But you can go down both sides of the table on both ends and just... I know you're orderly in that way. And then bring your, your, uh, your drink and your bread back to your seat, and we're going to take it together because I want to add just a little bit at that time. So if you would, let's do this. So you guys start, and the rest of us are just going to sing while you do that, right? So Joey's right here. Come to this side of the table. You guys, George, Colleen. Just come right here to this edge of the table and follow right after them. And we're going to sing that song that we opened up with when mine, had, you know, just wasn't what we was going to do. But it is. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your while they were sitting at the table, can you imagine? Jesus says, hey guys, let's sing. Can you imagine what that sounded like? And you're worried about your voice. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all. And I forgot to say it upstairs. I'd take it all if you went out. It's out right outside your door there. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, the Lord of all, all our hope is in you. All our hope is in you, all the glory to you, God, 
You're the light of the world, Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, you're the Lord of all. I want you to do something with me, would you? I want you to hold your bread and say, Jesus, I heard you call my name. Because you're invited to the table. It's not because, you, you don't have to repeat this part, it's not because of who you are. It's because of who he is. But he's inviting us to share his life because he knows that in the kingdom, that word exponential, that word that multiplies, that's what we are doing today. It says he took the bread and he blessed it. And so, Father, today as we are on this day between Thanksgiving and the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas. It's easy to get our eyes on all kinds of other things. But God, our greatest thanksgiving is that you came. You didn't have to. You didn't have to do any of this. And yet, you modeled calling us by name. And even calling us by a name that only you know. And only each individual. So God, today, we receive this because you've called us by name. And we thank you for the broken body represented by this bread. In Jesus' name, you may partake. Revelation chapter 2 says this. When Jesus spoke to the angel of the church of Pergamos, he gets down to the end and he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth except he that receives it. He's got a name for you that's not the name you were given. And the only way you receive it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is our identity. This, symbolically, is what makes us family. Doesn't matter what your earthly family is. Doesn't matter if you're accepted or not. Doesn't matter a bit. This is the invitation to a brand new family that says, I will call you my son, and I'll call you my daughter, and I will call you home, and you'll finally be home forever through the blood of Jesus Christ. It says that he took the cup and he blessed it. Let me bless it. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for the beautiful plan that came out of heaven. And the Christmas child that was born on earth, conceived by the Holy Spirit so that there could be life in the Spirit again on the earth. And you followed through with the plan all the way to the death, bringing your 12 and other believers, but showing them the way, and then saying, I'm going to go, but you're going to be here, and you're going to be my kingdom. Father, we accept the invitation into your kingdom. And this morning, that's what I would like you to repeat with me. Father, I accept your invitation into the kingdom. God, I thank you for everyone because together, God, we are something more than we ever could be without the blood of Christ. We're not only sons and daughters, but we're brothers and sisters. We're kin, we're family. We act like it, we walk like it, because you're at the table. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can drink. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's stand. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, for he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. Christ the Lord will give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory. Christ the Lord, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. God, we just want to worship you. We just want to say you're, you're all of it. Thank you, God, for the invitation to the table. God, I know where I've come from, and I know I still, I don't get it too much sometimes. But you always tell us, if you go in my name, you have the authority of my name. If you'll come to me, I'll redeem you, I'll forgive you, I'll satisfy you. And even if you blow it, I'm right here. I'm ready to receive you again. If you deny me, I'm just going to ask you if you really love me and I know what the answer is going to be. And so you're still invited to the table. So God, today we just want to say thank you, bless you. We're awed that such a huge plan seems like everybody would want a part of it, God. But so many of them just want to say, isn't that the carpenter? Don't we know his brothers and his sisters? And they get offended. Thank you, God, for allowing us to respond to the invitation. We're humbled. We're honored. And we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for being here this morning. I trust that this was something that makes it very real for you, and uh, that was its intent. And uh, God bless you, those of you who are in the Marriage Connection. See you back here, 5.30, and, uh, right? 5 o'clock, I'm sorry, 5 o'clock. And uh, yes, Daniel? Daniel?